This month we've been uh, sharing and speaking around the whole concept and theme and idea of family. And as we've progressed through the month, I've, I've really found it so interesting myself how God would speak to us about family this month where Christmas falls in. Each month that we've been as senior pastors, we felt the Lord has spoken to us about continuing around a specific theme and, and we've prayed as a leadership group and, and, and individually to really seek God as to what God might be saying and to spend a bit of time around these themes and ideas because, you know, so often there's so much that's said to us that we can, we can miss treasures in amongst conversations that we have with God. So it, it, it's very important to us and, and very important, I believe, to our church that, that we spend a bit of time around some, some things that God is speaking to us about. So family is a powerful thing that God has created. So let's read in Luke 2 and tie family into what I believe is one of the most amazing days in history. Here we see in Luke 2, in verse 7. And she brought forth her firstborn son. Her firstborn son, a son that opened her womb. This month we've looked and touched on the origin of our creation, the origin of each and every one of us, where God put us together. Whether we know God or believe in God, we all had a mother's womb that we came from. And the Bible says that in that space, that intimate, private, sacred place is the place that God knit each of us together. And how we live in a world that uses that sacred place that sacred place where each and every one of us was to begin and some don't get the chance to break forth from the womb through miscarriage, abortion and, and other things that humanity causes the loss of. But here we see a child breaking forth out of the womb as the firstborn. If you look through scripture, you'll find that the firstborn holds a very important place in the heart of God. The firstborn of animals, the firstborn of, of, of mankind. So here we see Jesus being brought forth and verse 7 goes on to say and he was wrapped in swaddling cloths and he was laid in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields keeping watch over their flocks by night and behold an angel of the Lord stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were greatly afraid then the angel said to them do not be afraid for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. Christmas is about the good tidings of great joy because a son broke forth from the womb. That son was the son of God. We see shepherds who are disturbed. We see shepherds who are disrupted. They are following their daily pattern. They are, they are operating their business. They are doing life and they are disrupted by this moment. I believe Christmas is where the Spirit of God disrupts the ways of the world and brings a message, the same message, every year because that's what we're celebrating. I have a birthday. I've had 44 of them. Next year, I'm looking forth to the celebration of my 45th. Hallelujah. And we celebrate it, right? My family and those that love me and those that know me. So every year, we, we, we go over the same story. But every year, it holds equal and greater impact as the story of the birth of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, disrupts the world we live in. My work this week is being disrupted. There's two days that my phone won't ring. Hallelujah. There's a disruption in my workplace because the Son of God was born. 
The time we celebrate because he, was, he came forth from the womb. Here's these shepherds being disrupted. Let's read on. They were told not to be afraid. You know, when God comes and disrupts your world, don't be afraid. If you're here this morning hearing another Christmas message and Christmas time is the time you give some time to the Christmas message and maybe you don't know God, don't be afraid. God is disrupting your world. He is disrupting your space because He is the great dysfunction disruptor. You know, humanity is dysfunctioning. Because of the fall of man and, and, and sinfulness of man, we, we all experience dysfunction. This is the time of the year that we're all told to focus on our family. Right? If you've been listening to the radio, if you've been watching the TV, if you've been walking through Canelands, you will have heard. It's family time. It's family time. Holidays are taken. I went for a delivery on Friday and I had to be there by 12 o'clock because the boys were out the door at 12 o'clock because they've got nine days off. The, the, the spirit, the life of Christmas, the Christmas time was disrupting that workplace, right? And there I was at that moment because it's time, it's the time of the year that bosses release their workers to spend time with family. Is it the world's idea or is it God's idea? I believe we're going to discover this morning that togetherness is the heart of the Father. That he brought Jesus from the womb of Mary because he had togetherness on his mind. Because he had created ones, you and I, who have been brought forth from a mother's womb, separated from him through sin. So he gave his son from the womb to come through the womb to bring reconciliation and to bind us back together with Father God. The Bible says that if we believe on Jesus Christ, we shall be made children of God. Now, who knows that a child is a member of a family? We're all children here. Hopefully, some of us act a little differently to what we were acting like when we were younger children. But we are all children, amen? Doesn't matter whether we know our mom or know our dad. Doesn't matter whether we have a relationship with them. We're their child. And Father God, through Christmas, through this time we celebrate, through the birth of His Son was willing, wanting, beckoning the ones he knit together in our mother's womb to be children of God, to be reconciled with Father God. When God disrupts your world, don't be afraid. For the disruption brings forth good news. So they were greatly afraid. In verse 10, the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. We sing about joy at Christmas, right? The carols are all about joy. Who watched the carols this week? You know, in the domain and, and, and wherever they are. You know, we're, we're, we come together to sing carols. We talk about joy. It's not the world's idea. It's God's idea. It's God's plan. The reason why there's joy is in verse 11. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling cloths lying in a manger. And we sing carols about it. The whole world sings about the manger that Jesus was born in. Yet the whole world has no clue or no idea that he is the true light. But we the church do, amen. We the church do. So here are these shepherds being told what they're going to find. And suddenly, in a moment, one angel became a multitude of heavenly hosts. This morning as we were singing to our Lord Jesus Christ, there are multitudes of heavenly hosts Recognizing and understanding who this child was. And here we see in verse 13, and suddenly there was, an, there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. You see, Christmas is toward men. 
Christmas is toward you and I. It is toward the one that God knit together in a womb somewhere. And so it was in verse 15 when the angels had gone away. Imagine angelic disruption in your life. This morning, there is the Son of God and He disrupts my life every day of my life with His life. As I walk through my life and, and the humanity of this man that I am, the, the, the world in which we live in that Jesus said we're a part of but He's overcome it, He disrupts he disrupts, he disrupts, not to bring fear, but to bring life. If God is the great disruptor of dysfunction, then God is also the great facilitator of function. So as we've been looking at family this month, I believe the Spirit of God has such a, a passion around family. Because family, the first man and woman, came together as husband and wife. And they were told to multiply and to bring forth. There was a, there was a blessing on, on Eve's womb to bring forth. To bring forth. And as generation after generation passed, the blessing was on the womb. Sin came and, and tarnished that. But in the womb is where God puts every one of us together. That didn't change. God's intention to, to bring children from mother and father is the same. So this year I pray as we meet with our families that there would be a level of honour that maybe we've never bestowed on mother and father in worshipping the father, our father. Turn with me to Ephesians 3 verses 14. And 15. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Paul is saying that there is a reason to bow and worship Father God because there is a family that Father God has instigated, has brought back together as sons and daughters of God as children of God, that are both here on earth and that are in heaven. This word family is the only time I've found it in the New Testament. It specifically speaks of our paternal descent. Paternal being from the Father. So here Paul is making reference that he understands and he worships Father God because through Jesus Christ, from the Father is possible. That I can live from the Father's plan. That I can live from the Father's function. That I can live from the Father's idea of who He put me together to be. Through the Son that broke forth and was born that we celebrate this season for. The family of God from the Father. A group of relatives or a whole race related to the Father is what that word family means in the Greek. So we are a group of relatives, the church, those that believe in God, a group of relatives put together as God's children. God's desire is for togetherness. In these days we live in selfish times. And we understand that independence and selfishness are the enemy of family. Fathers independently think of themselves and abandon families. Mothers independently think of themselves and abandon families. Children independently think of themselves and abandon family. Father God is the great disruptor to dysfunction. Because he is the great facilitator of function. It's his idea and it's his plan. The Bible says in the last days that men will be lovers of themselves. But when God raises a child, God's plan for the womb was that a child would be knit together and put together in that womb. And, and that mother and that father would then raise that child 
godly. That word godly speaks of devotion to the things of God. Absolute devotee to the things of God. So as children of God, the Spirit of God, through the life of Jesus Christ in us, enables us to be devotees of God. Imagine a family member, a family member of the Father, who has been transformed, who has been made alive through the life of Christ, going into a family environment in their circle of relatives, and bringing life and function where there's currently dysfunction. Oh God, thank you. Thank you for your son. Thank you, Father God, that you chose to send your son that I might have function not just in my life but in my family. Christmas time. Focus on the family. Father God is focusing on the family. Father God's focus is on the family. He's Father. He's Father God. His focus is on the family. The Lord God of heaven spoke to Abraham when he was seeking a wife for Isaac, his son. And Abraham decided that he would only follow God's plan. He would only follow what God had to say about this woman that that God would supply for Isaac to marry. That woman, Rebekah, was a barren woman. God supplied a barren woman to answer the prayer and the idea that God had for a generation to follow. God brings, brings barrenness to an end. He breaks the dysfunction of barrenness. I believe that as we celebrate Christmas church this year, that God is moving in the areas of barrenness in our life to disrupt that dysfunction and facilitate the function of life. He gave Rebecca to Isaac, Isaac knowing that that woman had to be. She was designated to be the mother of countless generations. And we see Isaac through the story in Genesis 24 holding on to God. I encourage you this morning, families, hold on to God. Hold on to God with everything that you've got. You are a child of God if you believe. And this morning, if you aren't a believer, there will be opportunity for you to place your faith in Jesus Christ and become a child of God, which is the purpose and the plan we're going to find in another scripture that I'm about to read that Jesus came for. If Jesus came for a purpose, then he was sent for the purpose, right? So the moment Jesus was born, the plan was working together for him to die on the cross and be crucified, to be raised from the dead so that you and I could become children of God through our belief and our faith in him. From this point, decide the Lord God of heaven, regardless of how humanity has disrupted your family. Regardless of how divorce, separation, violence, neglect, fear, expectation, and loneliness, decide today the Lord God of heaven. Abraham was issuing a decree to his son Isaac, regardless of what you find in your family function, the Lord God of heaven. The Lord God of heaven, we're only going to do it this way. He spoke to his servant and he said, if you don't find the woman that acts a certain way, that responds to the word of God, you are free from that oath. So Abraham was saying, only one way will God supply. There is one way to have life function in our family. And it's God's way. The world that, that is inspired by, I believe, Satan and his dark forces and principalities and powers, as we find in scripture, is the disruptor of that function. But Jesus Christ is the disruptor of the disruptor. Because he came to destroy every work that Satan has brought against the family. This morning, there is hope, there is power in Jesus' name to bring function into our homes, to bring life into our homes. And the church of God, the family of God, the children of God, I believe, carry a very powerful move in our city, in our nation, in our regions today. That we have the life of God impacting our lives so much that we carry the life of God, that life impact into our homes and into our families where we can love our children with a godly love. Where we can raise our children 
with a godly fear and a godly understanding. Where we as parents and grandparents, you know, if you don't have any children, you can raise one. Because of the way that you, the way you speak, the way you operate to the person sitting next to you who is a child. Every, remember, every one of us is a child. So we can all raise the function and the life of God just by our connection one to another. Togetherness, hallelujah. So we see family speaking about, we see the world speaking about family. As I consider my family this morning, it gives me great joy to enjoy the Christmas season because it's a season that family has opportunity to get together. My sister Karen, my sister Vicky are in the second back row. Christmas has provided an opportunity for family to get together. Christmas is a great time for the reward of togetherness. Turn with me to John 17. John 17, verse 20. Here Jesus is praying just before the end of his life. He says, I do not pray for these alone. He was praying previously for the apostles, the disciples. He says here, I do not pray for these ones that are with me alone, but also for those who will believe. That's you and me. Every one of us who believes in, in, in Jesus Christ has been prayed for by him himself. And he goes on to say, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, the word of those that know him now. All of us have come to know Jesus through someone's word, through the word of God, through someone sharing, through someone preaching, through, through an opportunity to understand who Jesus is. This morning, this is your opportunity. And I believe that Christmas time in the world is the opportunity for Jesus Christ to be exalted, for Jesus Christ to be elevated by the church. Not to back away and shy away because the world has discredited it, because the world has tarnished it, because the world has hijacked it, because the world has commercialized it. But the whole idea of the birth of the Son of God was God's. And this season is the reason we celebrate. He's the reason we celebrate. So here we see Jesus, the reason for celebration, saying in verse 21, that all may be one. Oneness. Togetherness. The idea, the heart of God in sending Jesus Christ is oneness. Imagine having oneness in function in your family. That's God's idea. That's his plan. That's the whole reason he sent his son is because he wants to see life functioning in every single circle of relatives here on earth. Here on earth, that's your circle, your family, the, of your father, of your descendants. God's desire is for oneness. As you, the father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us. Oneness together and oneness with Father God. My children will always be one with me. They're from me. They're mine. I can be on the other side of the world. There's no separation. They have my makeup. This is Father God's desire that every one of us would recognize and realize oneness with Him and oneness with each other. Let me read verse 21 again. That they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. This Christmas, we believe Jesus was sent. And as we meet in our families, as we meet on Christmas Day, and as we celebrate the season, the disruption to our life, there is a plan that Christmas is all about. Oneness together, oneness with the Father, that the world may believe a worldly christian sorry a worldly christmas value is the coming together of family that's a worldly christmas value right we can't separate this season by all the media and everything that that, we're, that we've been told that it's about coming together as family we are reminded to think of those around about us amen 
We are. We're reminded to think of those around about us who have lost family or whose family is broken of some sort or dysfunctioning. As this time of the year is especially difficult, let me give you a spin, a Spirit of God spin on this time of the year and how the world speaks about the brokenness of family. This time of the year is to celebrate the oneness of family. That there is a purpose and there is a plan through the life of Jesus Christ that we would be one with Him and one with each other. So no matter the defunction, no matter the, no matter the level of, of disharmony or brokenness that is happening in your family, there can be celebration this year because it's all about Jesus. Maybe the case for you is that some of us, Christmas reminds us of, us of our own brokenness. And maybe that's why we don't want to know about it. But brokenness can be healed. Brokenness can be restored. Last night, one of our utes was out on a delivery heading down to Mara. And the purpose of the ute was to take a part to a mine. And there was a big storm and the driver that we had in it uh, was coming around a bend and visibility was down and there had been a lot of rain and there was boulders on the road. And as he came around the corner, he swerved and hit a, a big rock. He's okay, he's fine, he continued the delivery. But when he got home this morning, he rang me and I was up early having a look at the damage. The youth's purpose is to deliver parts. But sometimes in life there is dysfunction, there's disruption to the purpose, right? As we focus on Christmas, there is dysfunction and there is disruption to its purpose. But it doesn't change what the purpose is. I may not be able to get in that ute today and take it on a delivery because it's got to have repairs. But that doesn't change its purpose. Right? Christmas may need to be repaired. My family needs some repair. As I celebrate two of my sister's companionship this Christmas, there's one that I haven't seen for many years. So though I celebrate the coming together of family and the joy that that brings, there's also the heartache of brokenness in the same experience. Because I'm enjoying the one whilst being reminded of the other. Jesus Christ is the answer to all dysfunction. Christmas provides that time, that ideal for family, which is both rewarding and heartbreaking at the same time. This family Christmas value that we celebrate of coming together as family is the Father God's idea. It is inspired by his great love for us and all the world. As I close this morning, won't you turn with me to John 1. The birth of Christ was the time in history that Jesus himself was speaking of in John 17. Verse 23, as you're going to John 1. John 17, 23 says that the world may know that you sent me, as I just read. This is the time that Jesus Christ was speaking about. This is the season that Jesus Christ himself was speaking about. That the world might know that I have come. And in John 1, there's a very powerful reason. I'm not going to read John. Uh, the idea is in John 1. Sorry, the scriptures I'm reading are out of John 1, verse 1 to 13. But I just want to pick up verse 12. But as many as have received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. No matter your family circumstance, believing and having faith in Jesus Christ, believing in his name, believing who he is, believing what he's done, gives us the right to become children of God. It's believing. It's not working. So therefore, all the levels of dysfunction in our life make no difference. 
Because Jesus is the perfect functioning son of God who gave his life that we might have life. This morning, if you've heard about Jesus, but you've never specifically decided, made decision, declared, acknowledged who he is, in sending Jesus, God set the plan of salvation. Salvation is the, forgi the forgiveness of sins as a gift from God's Son, Jesus Christ, who has paid the price for the sins of the world. I live in the revelation and the joy and the knowledge of knowing that I'm a forgiven man because of my belief in Jesus Christ. I live in the joy and the knowledge of knowing that I am a son of God, that I am of the family of God, and that there is a family in heaven that awaits, that I am one with and connected with. I have a brother who couldn't make it up this Christmas. He's, on, he's down in Budrum. And because we're not together, doesn't make us not brothers. And because we're not together with my other sister, doesn't make us not siblings. So there is a promise that the Bible speaks about in Ephesians 3 that there is a heavenly family that I'm connected to that one day I'm going to be introduced to that have lived for generations prior that have lived in my generation that will live in the generations after but we're family because we believe in Jesus. This morning would you admit to God that you're a sinner if you have not? Would you admit to God that there is dysfunction in your life that you need Him and His life for? The Bible says that for all have sinned and have come short of the glory of God in Romans 3.23. That's all of us are short of God's expectation. But through Jesus Christ, we're brought into family. We're made one. Would you believe in Jesus Christ as the saviour of the world? Not just a phantom, not just an idea, not just of some person, not just of some prophet, not just of some idea or some faith that Christians have in a man that you thought maybe lived 2,000 years ago, but that he is. You see, John 1, 1 says that in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, the Word was God, and the Word became flesh, that Jesus Christ is the beginning. He is God. Would you acknowledge and believe? For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Would you confess that you're a sinner? So not just admit it. Some of us stay in the admission stage. Well, I know I don't measure up. I know I'm not worthy. I know I've got some dumb stuff going on in my life. I know I've hurt people. I know I've told a lie. I know. Admission is the first step. It's one of those, it's, it's the area that you admit, which is, which is bringing surrender. The moment we admit to a fault, surrender is right there. But what pride does, pride wants to disrupt surrender. So it's important with God that we not only admit and believe, but that we confess. Because confession is the instigator. It's the step of surrender. Confess your sins to Jesus Christ and ask for His forgiveness. 1 John 1 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Admit, believe, and confess. Won't you stand this morning?